Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and uh, as it turns out, yesterday when I described my five-part aircraft as the smallest and simplest aircraft in the game, I was in fact lying. Because it has five parts, and this solid rocket booster-powered uh, aircraft, which my dad would no doubt be proud of, does in fact take only four parts, and is therefore a simpler design. It, however, if you uh, stick the wings at the center of mass, it is terribly, a terrible aircraft. And um, in every case, it wants to kind of dive into the ground. In fact, uh, if you try to fly parallel to the ground, you will probably end up crashing into the ground and killing your pilot. It also steers terribly, which is why I set this one up pointing in the right direction so I could at least fly past the tower and show how fast this thing accelerates before crashing into the ground. Um, I also, here we're going for a height altitude. We're gonna, you know, height uh, altitude record, height altitude. What the hell am I talking about? Going for an altitude um, test. You know, if you remember in the other one, I was able to get up to 27 kilometers. Well, um, because this one has limited burn time and you cannot throttle the burn, it is unsurprising that this thing basically runs out of fuel very early on and doesn't cruise much further before the air pulls itself back down. And we barely, yeah, we just get above 10 kilometers. And now, of course, I'm going to time accelerate down as we get to see uh, how this, as we try to return to the Earth. And uh, as you see, what we're, we're doing is we're trying to pick up enough forward speed that I have enough control. And yeah, here I'm just pulling back the whole time. But unfortunately, the nose is not responding. The whole thing is going forwards and... This aircraft does not feel particularly uh, controllable. Uh, I think uh, Darnie is getting ready to jump out. I'm not sure how successful we'll be. We'll find out. Just heading down towards the ground at about 100 meters per second. The vertical speed is about, I mean, between them, we've got about 75 vertical, 75 horizontal. And yes, Darnie does not survive. Now, clearly there are problems with air this aircraft, and to figure out what they are, they we're going to have to perform some extreme tests. And so here we have the bold astronaut stepping outside the cockpit as we jump into vertical, uncontrolled flight. Now, I'm presuming that he did this so that he could get a better look at uh, what's going on outside the aircraft during this uh, important phase. And... Um, Perhaps he's able to pick up on uh, something about the airflow over the wing surface or uh, the distribution of mass. I've no idea. Clearly, it is a very technical and uh, stupid thing to do. But um, I think he'll get back inside and uh, take a look, try controlling it at this altitude, and it actually seems relatively responsive. That's because you've got a lot of torque from the cockpit. He clearly, at a certain point, it no longer responds. Once uh, we flip over, you know, we're going to take a look around the aircraft from uh, other angles. As, as we start to descend, the nose starts to tip down. So he takes the opportunity to stand on the back and uh, zip around, take a look at it from a distance, watch how it wobbles in the flight and... Uh, quickly decides he's had enough and he'd like to get back inside this, even although, based on a previous experimental evidence, it is in fact a death trap. One wonders how he's going to get out of this, but uh, I mean, he has just clung to the side of a rocket that was speeding in supersonic speeds and uh, vertically, so maybe he has some special uh, superpower that will get him through this next uh, few minutes of, of flight. So, uh, yeah, we're just going to dive down towards the ground and try to maintain some level of control. Once again, the thing does not respond. He's pulling a full back on the joystick. Nothing is working. And uh, what he realized... And I'm just going to spoil this now because we got a long way down. <laughs> so much for the storytelling. What is going on here is... That the, the mass on this solid rocket booster, of course, drops, and that shifts the center of mass forwards. And when the center of mass comes forwards, that means that these fins end up behind the center of mass, so they're not as responsive. They tend to keep the rocket going straight rather than turning. 
um, with the previous aircraft, the fuel tank was in the middle and then there was an engine at the back and the cockpit at the front. So the center of mass didn't move very far. And so the control was maintained throughout. So to make this work, well, he's going to jump out and uh, he is supersonic. To, he, <laughs> he is a très super fantastique because he just bounces off the ground, picks himself up and goes off to tell the engineers that they need to move those wings forwards a little. Now, of course, moving the wings forwards a little means that it becomes a bit more unstable early on when the mass is further back. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I tried very hard to fly this uh, close to the ground, and it, it was just either high in the sky or smashed into the ground. But it didn't want to nosedive into the ground as soon as the, the power cut out, which I consider to be an improvement. So there we go, we're just zipping through the air. And now you see the nose is not diving into the ground. I'm managing to keep the, the attitude positive, even though we are descending towards the ground. But as we start to get lower, you see that actually the nose starts to rise and rise. So the wings are actually having a much more important effect. And in fact, I decide that I don't want to bring myself all the way up. I get vertical speed even. So um, I'm thinking I'm going to try landing this. Well, um, yeah, past tense, I did try and land this. <laughs> you can see, pulling the nose way up, I'm, I've reduced my, verdict, my horizontal speed to like 20 meters per second, which is uh, pretty darn slow. Uh, in fact, uh, I've certainly seen crashes that are fully survivable, uh, higher speeds, lower speeds. So the trick is now that when we pull back, or the problem is that when we pull back, the thing wants to roll left and right. So it's a question of kind of jockeying left and right to try and keep myself going forwards. If it turns too much to the left or right, what will happen is the wings won't bite as hard anymore. And I'll start to accelerate faster because the wings will just cut through the air that way. Um, it's kind of a bit like the VTOL problem where I had to manually adjust the roll. This is practically the same here. But yeah, you see that I'm coming down, still uh, just keeping it below 20 meters per second and mostly horizontal. 17, under 18 meters per second. I'm practically pointing this thing on its tail. I don't want to go too far because if you go too far, then there's a good chance you'll start to slide backwards. Also, uh, if you go too far, then it just keeps your vertical velocity too high. I'm trying to go downwards, but not so fast. And here we go. You can see the shadow coming. And I can overdo it a bit. But yeah, I bring the whole aircraft down, although uh, it does break apart. I would consider that the most successful landing. And now after the simplest aircraft, I, we come up with the smallest aircraft I could build. Instead of using a fuel tank, I use RCS and linear RCS engines. So I'm basically flying by holding the H key to accelerate forward. And this thing is ridiculously agile. I mean, it turns in all sorts of random directions, but uh, you know, if you can fly it, it works really nicely. Um, <laughs> I'm sure this works even better if you have like a joystick, but uh, my joystick, I've ne not been able to get the dead zone set up properly, so I've pretty much given up on this right now. Yeah, I'm just gonna, it doesn't have either as much fuel or as much thrust, but uh, it does fly really nicely regardless. It, it'll, uh, it's gonna bur burn out soon, but it's definitely more, um, more stable and because the mass of the fuel tank is a lot lower we don't have to deal with the, the center of mass shifting as much like we did with the um, the solid rocket booster and hey you know there is some level of uh, control because you can turn the rocket thrust on and off and yeah because the mass is so much lower um, I mean Basically, this RCS tank is practically empty when it is, it weighs practically nothing when it's empty. Um, I can almost fly this around by just pitching up and down and essentially making the wings flap. But yeah, I'm going to try and land this thing here softly, or at least softly enough that the pilot survives. Just getting in very carefully, very carefully. Just flaring, going to flare, and oh, there we go using the rest of the spacecraft to uh, cushion the landing of Buzz Kerman. 
But uh, there is, I'm looking for practical applications now, and uh, here is one example of a practical application. Instead of using a capsule, I'm using the Mech Jeb pod. So this is another five-part rocket. Because the capsule is gone, it's a whole lot lighter, and I'm not even touching the controls, so I'm not having to deal with my uh, awful over jerky controls. I'm just basically telling it to hit surface angles and controlling it from that. And it, flies pretty well on this uh, rocket thrust here. I'm just watching the, the vertical speed and trying to adjust my pitch plus or minus a couple of degrees to keep myself more or less at a roughly a constant altitude above the surface. We're just going to do some time acceleration because this is of course going to take a while before we run out of fuel. And not only that, once we run out of fuel, it is going to be a very slow and deliberate glide to bring us back to the surface. What I'm going to be doing is basically adjusting the pitch upwards to try and keep my vertical velocity from dropping too low. And because there is so much lift on these wings compared to the mass of the aircraft, I mean, the wings are tiny, but the spacecraft is even tinier. I can essentially keep my vertical velocity at uh, below one meter per second. So it's just a tr uh, the question of timing it so that I come up to 90 degrees and land on my tail as I hit zero on the altitude. Now the obvious application here is to send probes to the surface of places like Jewel and Eve, places where we wouldn't want to send the astronauts because, well let's face it, they wouldn't be coming back. But we can send Mech Jeb there with a clear conscience. And by carefully exploiting the aerodynamics, we can probably get a lot of life out of these probes. We can probably fly them until we get bored, to be quite honest. And if we want to abandon any sense of realism, we can put half a dozen of these wings around a space probe and have it spin around forever, essentially not losing altitude in the, the atmosphere of Jewel or Eve. Anyway, as we return the video to normal speed, you see that we're moving at like 10 meters per second. We're less than 15 meters up. I mean, at this speed and altitude, the, the spacecraft is probably going to survive. The question is, you know, in what state will it be? And all I'm doing is I'm just sitting here and increasing the pitch very slowly. The vertical speed is like, it's sometimes going positive, but it's generally hanging around 0.2 meters per second. We're getting down to four meters, three and a half, three meters. You can see what we're going to do. And there we go to 90. So now I'm just sliding and I'm going to let the tail touch there we go, just sliding across the landscape. That does a perfectly smooth touchdown. May all your landings be as smooth as this one. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.